Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Sharon Begley. Sharon is an American journalist who is the senior science writer for STAT, the publication for the Boston Globe that covers stories related to the life sciences. Previously, she was the senior health and science correspondent at Reuters, the science columnist at the Wall Street Journal, and previous to that, the science editor at Newsweek. Her interests include the neuroplasticity of the brain, issues affecting science journalism and education. Uh, She's the co-author with Jeffrey Schwartz of The Mind and the Brain, the author of Train Your Mind, Change Your Brain, and co-author with Richard J. Davidson of The Emotional Life of Your Brain, which will be the topic of our discussion today. Hello, Sharon. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Thank you, Barry, and thank you also for the kind introduction. Okay, well, could you maybe begin by telling us a little bit about your, your background and and how you got involved with Richard and, and in the project of, of writing the book? Right. So as you said, I have been a science writer for my entire career, um, focusing largely on neuroscience, um, genetics, mostly the life sciences. And a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to be invited to Dharamsala to a meeting that the Dalai Lama was holding between a number of Western scientists and a number of Buddhist scholars. Um, And the topic of that meeting was neuroplasticity, which is basically the brain's ability to change its structure and function. And at that meeting, I met Richard Davidson. He was one of the scientists who both helped organize it and was participating in it. And I got to know a little bit about his research. And and Davidson is best known because he has um, been very close to the Dalai Lama, so much so that a number of Buddhist meditators, scholars, etc., have made the trek to Madison, Wisconsin, where he's a professor at the University of Wisconsin, to volunteer their minds for science. And Davidson has done um, just path-breaking studies um, on the, the the mind of the adept meditator. Anyway, so at that meeting, um, Davidson and I talked about his work, and he had so much to say, and he had accomplished so much in his studies over the decades that we just connected, and this book is the result. Fantastic. Could you arguably say that uh, Richard Davidson is the the founder of Effective Neuroscience? He really is. And um, affective neuroscience, of course, is a study of emotions. And he really was blazing a trail back then. Um, his his initial forays into this field date back to the 70s and 80s. And at the time, you know, saying that you were going to study the emotional side of the brain was, you know, just basically saying that you were going to banish yourself from all respectable neuroscience. Um, um, Studying emotions was just not the way to go. Um, At the time, um, neuroscientists thought that cognitive neuroscience, cognitive psychology was the way to go, and that the highest expressions of the human brain were to be found in, oh, you know, problem solving, speech, thinking, remembering, all of those um, exalted things. And emotion was like the riffraff of the brain. It was just this thing that unfortunately the brain did, and maybe you had to pay attention to it occasionally, Um, but emotions just were not important. Um, And he thought, well, wait a minute, um, you know, I and my friends and everybody I know um, has a very rich emotional life and it has to come from the brain because we don't think the emotions are coming from the pancreas. So surely there must be something interesting to study there. And he, uh, as you say, Barry, just founded the science of effective neurobiology. Okay, so to what degree would you say the book puts forward a new model of personality? Right, so Davidson's life's work has led toward the recognition that we all have something that he calls emotional styles. And an emotional style is a consistent way of reacting to the experiences we have, to the environment we find ourselves in. Um, So to your question about personality, Davidson argues that emotional styles are much more fundamental 
they're even more real in the sense that they have a physical manifestation in the brain. So, for instance, um, he has identified um, six emotional styles, and for each one, there's a very distinct, discrete neural correlate. In other words, a pattern of brain activity that goes along with this or that expression of an emotional style. And you can't say that for personality. Personality is, is more of a construct. And Davidson argues that emotional styles are, you know, if you want to take an analogy from chemistry, emotional styles are the atoms that make up the rest of matter. So there might be, at, you know, at the top of this heap, personality, which is made up of a lot of atoms, a lot of different elements of emotional style, but it's emotional style that really is the basis and therefore is more scientific. So Davidson's argument is that, you know, personality, as we describe it, um, is all well and good, but if you really want to understand what makes you up, what makes up your friends, you know, people you are close to, you really have to focus on emotional styles. Okay, and so given that, then they don't particularly correspond to the personality types that we you know that we're normally accustomed to right but you can so when i was using the analogy of atoms for instance um the idea is that you can take pieces of emotional style and put them together in a certain way to get personality types that we're more familiar with um i mean actually at, at this point we should probably say what um the emotional styles are. Yeah. So um, again, just very briefly, because we can talk about this um, more as we go along. Um, Davidson has identified six emotional styles and just briefly, they are resilience, which is how slowly or quickly you recover from adversity. Yeah. Outlook, which is how long you're able to sustain a positive emotion. Social intuition is how well you pick up social signals from the people around you. Self-awareness, which is basically self-explanatory, but it also refers specifically to how well you perceive bodily feelings that reflect emotion, like, you know, is your heart racing or something. Okay. Sensitivity to context is the fifth one, and that means how good you are at regulating your emotional responses based on the context you find yourself in. So, you know, you wouldn't tell the same jokes at a party with your boss as you would if you were, you know, down at the pub with your friends or something. Yeah. And finally, attention is also one of the emotional styles. Anyway, so those six are the basic ones. And so to your question about um, personality, Barry, let me give you just one example of how you can put the atoms together. So one of the well-recognized personality types is openness to new experience. Somebody who is, you know, open, who is, um, you know, I want to try new things, I want to meet new people, I want to think about new ideas. So that's considered a standard um, form of personality. So Davidson's argument is that you are, if you are high in openness, what that really means is that you have strong social intuition, you're very self-aware, and you tend to have a very focused attention style. So again, those three things, the emotional styles, do have actual brain manifestations. And if you put them together, this thing that emerges is what we call in personality science, openness to experience. Anyway, so it's just a new way of looking at ourselves. And the reason it's important is that once you recognize the brain patterns that the emotional styles come from, you can you know, understand them better and also do something about it. Yeah. And as you say, they have this basis in science that they they have a solid foundation in patterns of brain activity. Exactly. And once you I mean, so getting back to um, what I was saying earlier about my fascination with neuroplasticity and the Dalai Lama's meeting, um, the the whole thrust of neuroplasticity, again, the ability of the adult brain to change its form and function is that once you recognize what pattern of activity in the brain underlies something, whether it's depression or OCD um, or something non-pathological. Yeah. If you can then figure out a way of changing that pattern of brain activity, then you can change the the result. Um, and that's been used, again, to to help people who are suffering from chronic depression, to help people who have obsessive compulsive disorder. So in the case of emotional styles, the point is once you understand what brain activity underlies, let's say, poor social intuition, or what brain activity underlies um, very, very poor resilience, like you're always knocked on your feet 
um, knocked on the, you know, on your heels when you have a, a, an emotional or, you know, just social setback. Once you understand those, then you can figure out a way to change that pattern of brain activity. And the result is you can shift your emotional style. That's obviously incredibly empowering then, isn't it, Sharon? Well, exactly. And that is what so attracted me to Davidson's work. Um, again, once I had, you know, become steeped in neuroplasticity, um, so much of what I cover as a journalist, again, especially in genetics and neuroscience, ha has been portrayed by the popular press as what's often called neurodeterminism or genetic determinism. The idea that the genes you inherit from mom and dad or the pattern of brain activity that you have is not only innate, but fixed, it's hardwired, it's not going to change, it's, you know, you have it when you emerge into the world and you'll have it and be that way until they put you in a pine box. And, you know, for so many years, I thought that was both wrong scientifically, but also such a, um, a downer of yeah. a message, right? You know, I mean, it's like you, you tell a child or a young adult or gosh, even, you know, someone my age, um, that this, this way that you are is because of your brain activity. Somehow people then think, oh, well, then that's, it. that's it. There, there's no hope of changing. Or this way that you are is because of your, the genes that you inherited. Um, again, then people are very likely to just throw up their hands and say, well, that's the way it is. I have no possibility of changing. Anyway, so the, work on neuroplasticity has sent a very, very different message. Yes, you can change your brain. And Davidson's work has taken that one step further. Because of our understanding of neuroplasticity, you can shift, you can change your emotional styles, and therefore you can change how you interact with the world, with your friends, with your colleagues, etc., if you want to do that. Yes. So it's a very empowering message, and that, as I say, is, is really what attracted me to it. No, and apparently exciting too. Uh, well, um, could you just give us um, a rough overview of, of some of these patterns then? For example, how is the resilience style characterized in brain activity? Right. So, um, again, Davidson has done just tons of studies, um, getting people into his lab and using neuroimaging to see what pattern of brain activity goes along with, you know, different expressions of emotional style. So, um, again, resilience is um, very interesting because it's so important. Um, again, resilience means how well you bounce back from adversity. It can be something minor, like you got into a terrible traffic jam on the way to work. Is that going to keep you in a bad mood for the rest of the day? Or are you the kind of person who, as soon as you walk through the door of your office, you shake off the terrible traffic jam? Anyway, it turns out that greater activation on the left side of the front part of the brain, which is called the prefrontal cortex, um, goes along with higher resilience. And what seems to happen is that this left prefrontal cortex sends messages down to part of the emotional brain, which is called the amygdala, yeah. telling it basically, hush, be quiet, quiet down, because the amygdala is the part that is telling us, uh oh, something is wrong. If you just had a bad experience, there must be more bad experiences coming. Be very on edge, be very wary. Um, and that is what keeps you from being resilient. You just, you know, remain in this very um, agitated or anxious mood. But if you have strong activi activity activation in the left prefrontal, it acts as a break on that activity in the amygdala. And people who have that pattern turn out to be just very, very resilient. And the flip side of that is, is if your left prefrontal cortex activity is quite weak, then the amygdala just, you know, runs away with itself, as it were, and you are not very good at bouncing back from adversity. So how then can we find out what emotional styles we have. I mean, we, we don't all have access to an MRI scanner, do we? No, although the way things are going, I think it's going to be in every corner drugstore before you and I are done here, actually. <laughs> um, so what Davidson has done is um, look at the results he got in the lab and come up with uh, 10 question uh, questionnaires that allow people to sort of self-diagnose. Um, um, so we included them in the book and since we're doing resilience, let me give you just a few examples. If you have a minor disagreement with a close friend or your significant other, are you out of sorts for hours? 
or you know, is it just something that passes in a few minutes? Um, let's see, if you're being considered for an important professional award or promotion or something good at work, and it goes to someone who you think is less qualified, can you move on quickly or do you just, you know, sit there and smolder over the injustice of it all? So it, it's things like that. And um, the way he has set it up, um, you give yourself a point for uh, true or false answers to the questions and then you add them all up. And depending on where you fall on the scale of basically zero to 10, um, you are more resilient, you're less resilient, or you're, you know, somewhere in the middle. So there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and there's no necessarily ideal way to be. Um, and these emotional styles all exist along a spectrum from very to less so. So some people are very resilient and others are hardly resilient at all. Okay. So, so sometimes you could have too much of one in effect then uh, or too little of another yes and you know you ask um or people might ask well you know what's the ideal emotional style and there really isn't one except if the way you are again um what's what i love so much about the questionnaires is that they allow you or or actually push you to introspect when you you know think about these situations and answer the question you're really looking into yourself and asking how you operate in the world how you react to experiences anyway so you might think well it's of course much better to be resilient life is full of ups and downs and the faster you can bounce back the better so we should all want to be at the high end of resilience but as davidson explained to me um Maybe not. Maybe when you or someone close to you experiences something, um, you know, tragic, you actually do not want to bounce back from that very yeah. quickly. You want to, you know, you want to absorb the lesson of it. You want to think about it. You certainly don't want to tell someone else who has ex experienced a terrible loss. Oh, don't worry, you'll get over it. I mean, you know, how often have any of us who have experienced a tragedy experienced that as well, where people come tell us, oh, you know, you'll be fine next week or whatever. So that extreme of resilience might not be so great either. Um, and similarly with outlook. Um, so outlook goes from a very pessimistic outlook to a more positive one. And you might think, oh, my goodness. Well, um, of course, everybody wants to be as happy as possible, you know, maximize well-being. And Lord knows there you can fill, you know, entire shelves in libraries with books telling you how to how to do that. Um, but maybe not having such an extremely positive outlook um, has something going for it because if you're always sunny if you always think things will work out you know for the best maybe you don't try as hard um whereas if you're a bit more of a pessimist and think oh my gosh things are really not going to work out unless i put all of my effort into it unless i you know throw myself into whatever it is i'm hoping to achieve you know there can be something there's something to be said for the pessimists among us as well. So those are just two examples of where, you know, the, the sort of superficial reaction to where you want to be on the spectrum of one of these emotional styles might not really be as ideal as it initially seems. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. So um, when was the idea of the, the emotional style born? What was the trigger? Right. So he was a young professor. And he, as we were saying earlier, was interested in emotions. So he ran an experiment just trying to elicit very basic, simple emotions from his volunteers. Um, and by basic, simple emotions, I mean positive or negative. Um, a happy, oh, that's so cute or fun or nice versus, oh, that's horrible and disgusting and frightening. And the way he did this was by showing and this, I have to tell you, remind you, Barry, this was in the day before the Internet and cute kitty videos. Um, so <laughs> what, he, what he did is show his volunteers um, puppies frolicking with flowers and cute animals in the zoo, things like that. So he really was a pioneer, um, again, before cute kitty videos. Um, and those were meant to elicit the happy emotions. On the other side were um, images of a leg being amputated um, and a horrific uh, burn victim. And those were meant to elicit 
um, negative emotions, you know, characterize them as anxiety or disgust or something. Anyway, to make a long story short, he measured brain activity when people were looking at um, all of these images. And he found, not surprisingly, um, when you look back at it, that one side of the prefrontal cortex, the left side, was more active when people saw positive images and the right side was more active when they saw negative images. So that itself was a fairly interesting finding. Um, but what he then, and interestingly, he had these data for years and years and years. And again, it was left side seems to go along with happy, positive, right side activation goes along with negative, depressed, whatever. Um, it was only years later when he was looking at all of this data that he noticed one thing. It's not only that left was higher than right, for happy versus not so happy, but that the left, the amount of left side activity in this volunteer as compared to that one, as compared to that one, would differ by an, or, an orders of magnitude, like 300 times higher. So some people, when they were feeling positive emotions, had 300 times the activity in their left prefrontal cortex as other people who wow. were feeling happy. These were just like the happy Olympians, honest to God. Um, and the, the difference between left, right in a single person was only like 30%. So this just, um, you know, knocked him back on his heels. He realized that there's just a range of capabilities in terms of the basic emotion of positive and negative. That was the foundation for the outlook emotional style. Um, and that was when he realized that people's capabilities in the emotional realm varies tremendously. And thus was born the idea of emotional styles. And that was around 1989. So it's something, as I said earlier, that he's been working on for decades. And that arguably is the, the central question that has been been basically challenging him since, since then, really, isn't it? Well, it has been. Um, and, um, you know, going back to your point earlier that he is the uh, the founder of affective neuroscience. Um, I mentioned a minute ago that the region of the brain that is more or less active when people feel positive or negative emotions is the prefrontal cortex. Um, and then as now, the prefrontal cortex is best known as the area that's in charge of higher order cognition. Notice I said cognition, not emotion. Yeah. The prefrontal does planning, it does judgment, it does problem solving, it does all these things that in answer to one of your first questions, um, I was describing as the pinnacle or what is thought to be the pinnacle of the human mind, um, the thing that psychologists and neuroscientists really wanted to study. But lo and behold, it turns out that the esteemed prefrontal cortex is also deeply involved in emotion. And that was the discovery that showed the world that it's not just these primitive reptilian areas of the brain, the amygdala, the limbic system, et cetera, that have something to do with emotion, but also the lofty prefrontal cortex regions involved in cognition. So this divide that, you know, had long characterized both neuroscience and psychology that there's thinking and cognition over here and emotion over there, um, Davidson's work just completely um, showed that to be incorrect. It's one integrated whole, the emotions and thought cognition all interact. Um, so to banish the emotions to, you know, the basement of the brain really made absolutely no sense. Yeah. And I've, I've heard that with people who have had suffered a lesion or a stroke, whatever, where, the, where the emotional aspects of the brain have been knocked out, these people they live very chaotic random lives because they they can't set goals you know again you talk about the prefrontal cortex you know they don't know what to want do they exactly exactly and it's the two-way traffic between the, the prefrontal and these other regions um again that was what we were talking about with resilience the prefrontal sends messages to the amygdala and it's that traffic that has to do with how resilient you are but yes i mean there was a fascinating experiment um along the lines that you just alluded to um a poor gentleman had suffered a lesion in his brain it was in the uh the core emotional regions. And when he was at his uh, neurologist's office and the question was, okay, when can we make, when what day would be good for you for your next appointment? He was frozen. 
Yeah. And you wouldn't think it's an emotional question, um, but just, you know, being shown the calendar without resort to his emotional brain, he had no feel for what would be a good day for his next appointment. Did Monday feel better than Wednesday? Did Thursday feel worse than Tuesday? He couldn't tell and he was frozen. So without the two way traffic between emotion and cognition, we are just we are we are non-functional. Yeah. And there was a, another experiment mentioned in the book that I thought was uh, seminal in, in in regard to this. You know, I think it was the Duchenne smile experiment, you know, and that really also challenged this entrenched assumption that reason and emotion are separate. Could you explain why? Yes. So uh, Duchenne smile um, is something that's been understood uh, since the 1800s. And it's very interesting to know about, especially next time you're in a social situation or even a work situation. A Duchenne smile refers to a smile where your cheek muscles up to the, you know, the, the crinkly part at the corners of your eye. All of that is in play. A non-Duchenne smile is just when the corners of your mouth go up. And next time you see someone who is smiling at you and only the mouth is in play and the eyes aren't crinkly and the cheeks, cheek muscles are not rising as well, you can be pretty sure that that's a false smile. Whereas if someone's <laughs> eyes are crinkly and their cheek muscles are rising, that is a um, an honest smile. That person is really happy to see you or really you know, thinks that what you just said is amusing or something. Um, anyway, so the point is of a Duchenne smile is that is it is an accurate, true reflection of the emotion you are feeling, of what is happening in your brain. So initially, when um, Davidson was coding what people what people's brains were doing when they saw these happy or sad images, again, the puppies versus the burn victims, um, the data were all over the map and nothing seemed to go along with anything else. And it was then that, thank goodness, he was video um, video recording the participants because he saw that only when people had a true smile, a Duchenne smile, only then was the quote unquote happy pattern in their brain engaged. And the false smiles the happy pattern was not engaged. Um, and that is what led to the recognition that the prefrontal cortex, because that's where happy or less happy brain activity goes on, um, that the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of the brain, is deeply involved in emotion. Fascinating. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about how we should be wary of um, seeing, when we're talking about neuroplasticity, that things aren't innate in our neurocircuitry. So what, what would you say have we learned about nurture's effect on nature in the last 30 years or so in relation to this? Right. So as always, you start with the lab animals. Um, and there was a fascinating experiment um, at McGill University in Montreal. The scientist's name is Michael Meany. And he took um, uh, lab rats that were, uh, that seemed to be innately um, mellow. Um, yeah. it, it's what you ask. So what is a mellow lab rat? Well, it's a lab rat that is exploratory. It likes to, you know, sniff around and see, um, what's happening in its cage. It doesn't, um, you know, shy away or run away from, um, a, a human being who looms over it. Um, and other rats were very, very, very anxious. They would cower in a corner of their cage, etc. And he, the, the rats um, reproduced and the offspring of the mellow rats were also mellow and the offspring of the anxious rats were also very anxious. And so you would conclude from that, oh, well, clearly these are genetically transmitted traits, right? Um, so when I was saying earlier about the dogma of genetic determinism, that's exactly the kind of experiment that's always trotted out to say, oh, look how, you know, how mellow or anxious you are, as well as how mellow or anxious the rats are, that's all determined by the uh, the DNA that you inherit. So Meany didn't uh, sit on his laurels. What he did instead was what he calls sort of a rodent adoption agency. And what he did was have the um, offspring of the mellow animals transferred to the cages of the anxious mothers. These were now female rats. And the offspring of the anxious mothers were transferred to the cages of the mellow mothers. So they were each cross-rearing the, the other's offspring. And what he found was that regardless of how the rats were born, regardless of who their mothers, their parents were, how they were raised determined how they would be, whether they would be mellow 
or anxious. Um, the offspring of mellow rats, if they were raised by anxious rats, became anxious and vice versa. The offspring of anxious rats, if they were raised by mellow moms, became mellow. And what really sealed the deal for this experiment was that he then um, analyzed their DNA and he found that genes that were associated with anxiety, those were literally turned off in the rats that were raised by mellow mothers. So, and what does a mellow mother do? do? Well, she licks her rat pups all the time. She grooms them, she takes care of them, um, whereas the anxious moms tend to leave them. Um, and somehow something in that mellow mother rat's behavior toward her pups changed the very structure of their DNA and allowed them to have a different rat personality. Um, and so that was a very, very striking example of how the way you are ra raised, nurture, can absolutely trump nature. Wow, yeah. Just in respect to that, though, I'm thinking of, um, about that, that famous incident of the, you know, the Romanian orphans when they, in their very early period of their lives, they were, um, they had no physical contact or intimacy with, with adults or especially mothers. And then later in life, many of them were put into the care of very caring families and there was change but there was still there was arguably still damage done so my question is how formative are those early years and how much change can happen yes so in the case of the lab animals they were moved into their to, uh, new cages with the new mothers right at birth in the case of the Romanian orphans, um, some were adopted um, mostly by Western families, a lot in Western Europe, a lot in the United States, a lot in Canada, at different ages. Yeah. The children who were adopted out, who were, I, I guess we can say, rescued from the orphanages, um, before the age of two or three, they tended to be the ones who were able to form loving bonds with their new family. Um, the ones that you're um, describing, Barry, the one they ha who had a great deal of difficulty um, overcoming their early upbringing and forming uh, loving relationships with their adoptive parents, they tended to be older children. They had been languishing in those orphanages through the age of, you know, seven, eight, nine, even older. Yeah. So the lesson we draw from that is that as the brain gets older, it absolutely does become more difficult to change entrenched patterns. But I, you know, I don't want to leave it there because what we have learned from neuroplasticity is that once you understand the underlying brain basis for whatever behavior you're talking about, once you figure out the intervention, that intervention really can be very powerful, so much so that it can change brain activity in adults who are, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, even older. Yeah. I would say that in the case of the Romanian orphans, we still don't know explicitly, precisely enough what is the brain activity that underlies their inability to form emotional connections. Because, and I hope I'm not being too Pollyanna-ish here, but I would say, based on what we know about neuroplasticity, if that brain pattern could be discovered, and if an intervention could be found that would mitigate it, that would reverse it, then, you know, even once they're teenagers, um, it could be that all is not lost. Um, it's just, it really is a, a scientific question, a research question. But from all we've learned about neuroplasticity, it would just be wrong to throw up our hands and say there's no possibility here. No, I, I'm, and I'm, I can relate to that from my own experience, even with my elderly family members. I know that people can still change even into their 70s and 80s. There you go. See, message of hope. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and another thing I found interesting in the book was your suggestion that a good way of thinking about DNA is that rather than seeing it as the software running our cells or music sheets dictating what music will be played, it's better to sort of think of it as a, a music collection. Could, could you just expand on that a little bit? Right. So this is um, a way that I found I could understand Meany's rat adoption work a little better. Um, so DNA, again, the, the genetic inheritance we have from our parents is like the extensive CD collection, you know, of your friend who's a crazy music buff. Just because you have a CD doesn't mean that you'll play it. And just because you have a gene does not mean that it's turned on or expressed, as, as the geneticists say. Instead, the extent to which genes are expressed 
and it can be a gene having to do with anxiety, as in the rat experiment, has to do with the environment we find ourselves in. So if you have a genetic bent toward anxiety, if you're raised in an environment that nurtures um, equanimity, it can silence that anxious DNA. So it, it's as if you never took that CD out of the stack and, and put it in the player. Just because you have a certain gene does not mean that it will be expressed. Yeah. In other words, is this is this epigenetics what we're talking about? Yes, it exactly is. We've got that. OK, so um, well, let's move on now to how we can use this information about our emotional styles to actually changing the way we are. Now, um, one of the things that is emphasized in, in the book is contemplative neuroscience or med meditation and mindfulness. Could you talk about a little bit of uh, some of the ways how that can be used to effectively um, alter our emotional styles one way or the other? Right. So Davidson is very big on the idea of what he calls neurally inspired therapy, which means neural, obviously referring to the brain, that you can that you figure out what brain activity underlies whatever trait you're you know you're interested in changing. And then you target that neural activity through some behavioral therapy. Um, and he has found just oodles of examples where um, meditation, in particular mindfulness, mindfulness meditation, can alter these patterns of brain activity. Um, so for instance, um, oh gosh, how about self-awareness? Um, that's the emotional style in which you are or are not aware of your the responses of your body to different experiences and environments um and if your amygdala is very is highly active and your uh frontal cortex is fairly quiet um mindfulness meditation has been found to to alter that pattern so that you can um become more self-aware. So for instance, um, mindfulness meditation, of course, is when you practice observing your thoughts, your sensations, your feelings, etc., moment by moment and non-judgmentally. Um, and if you observe yourself non-judgmentally, you can break the chain of associations that arise from many thoughts. Um, so Davidson has found that mindfulness meditation um, can decrease activity in the amygdala and other regions that promote self-awareness um, and therefore you can shift again if you find your self-awareness either too much or too little you can shift it in the direction that makes you more comfortable and, and also for the lay person could you explain what cognitive behavioral therapy is and what role that can play in in adjusting our emotional styles right so um cognitive behavior therapy has is related to mindfulness in that it asks the person to think about their thoughts. Um, so CBT was developed in about the 1960s, and it's basically a form of mental training, so not too different from what um, you know, practicing Buddhists do. Um, it focuses on teaching people to respond to their emotions and thoughts and behaviors in a healthy way and to reappraise dysfunctional thinking. So, for instance, um, if you, gosh, if you have a bad experience at work, if you are prone to catastrophizing um, and say, oh, I'm going to be fired, CBT teaches you to take a deep breath, take a step back, ask yourself, is that really likely? In fact, might it not be the case that other people have had the same experience in their professional lives and have not been fired? In fact, people in your own office have had that experience and not been fired. Perhaps you have had the experience before and have not been fired. Um, anyway, so patients learn to recognize their habit of catastrophizing. Um, and with this cognitive skill, they can dial down the catastrophizing. Um, and the reason that's relevant to emotional styles is if you are low on the resilience scale, for instance, it could be because every little setback causes you to catastrophize. So CBT, um, which is not a terribly intensive psychotherapy, Barry, it's not, you know, one of these Woody Allen things where you sign up for, you know, an hour a day for 50 years every, etc. Um, but it's something that you can usually do through a course of once a week for 12 weeks, and then you learn to do it on your own. So it really is something um, that uh, gives you a skill that you can apply to yourself. 
Um, and CBT has been shown to be um, quite effective in treating depression and treating obsessive compulsive disorder, a number of other actual disorders. Um, and therefore, it's not a stretch at all to think that it could nudge you a little bit in either direction along these spectrums of emotional style. Sure, yeah. And, and you also suggest that not only can we change our emotional style to better fit the world, we can change our world to better fit our emotional style. Could you, could you give us a, maybe an example of that? Yes. Yeah, so I really like this one because, um, you know, whether it's children who are diagnosed with ADHD or people with anxiety disorders, you know, I think we have to recognize that the world can be very demanding and difficult and everything else. And sometimes the reactions that we have, although they're deemed pathological, might actually be, you know, fairly adaptive. So the point is there are ways that you can arrange your environment to accommodate your particular emotional style. And Davidson uses the example of the attention style. Um, and attention can be either very, very focused or very, very broad. Somebody who is very, very focused, um, if somebody comes into the room or tries to talk to them when they're reading or working, whatever, they tune out that person. They have no idea that someone is even there. And if you are married to a person like that, that will drive you crazy. Um, but the other form of attention is a very, very wide focus. They take in everything from their peripheral vision, the slightest sound, etc. And there are pros and cons to either. But let's say that you want to be more focused. Therefore, you need to minimize distractions. So at your workspace, get rid of as many extraneous stimuli as you can. Keep things quiet. Close your door if you can. Um, practice doing one thing at a time, not multitasking. Um, don't listen, you know, don't do Facebook. Don't have, you know, social media open on one tab when you're trying to write in a Word document. Um, if you're writing or using a spreadsheet or, or whatever you do in your, um, in your work. Um, do that and only that. Um, even something as simple as don't have a ton of pictures on the wall. Just don't have any visual or auditory stimuli that can pull you away from what you're trying to do. Anyway, so that's the sort of thing. And, um, you know, throughout the book, um, we, we also talk, we talk about other ways that you can change the environment depending on what your emotional style is. Great. Okay. The last chapter provides some practical training techniques for adjusting our emotional style. Could you give us a couple of examples? Let me try the one for social intuition. Um, so social intuition um, basically means being able to understand what other people are thinking and feeling. Um, and this grew out of Davidson's work with children who fall on the autism spectrum, who are very bad at doing that. Um, and someone who is, as he describes it, puzzled. So they're very poor at social intuition. Um, again, there's a pattern of brain activity that underlies that, um, which we talk about. Um, and therefore, the intervention is to increase activity where it's too low. And the first thing you need to do is pay attention. Um, in order to detect social cues, you need to actually observe them. So Davidson suggests um, starting with strangers. If you're out in a public place, um, pick you know a, a small group of people and watch them. Pay pay attention to their faces. Um, see if you can tell from somebody's facial expression what their voice is going to sound like. Are they agitated? Are they calm? Um, see if you can predict how they'll, you know, touch each other on the arm or something, how close they'll walk together, whether they'll look into each other's eyes when they're speaking. Um, see if you can predict from tone of voice um, what the body language and facial expressions are going to be. Because tone of voice, body language, facial expression, these are all clues to what someone is feeling and also to some extent thinking. So Davidson suggests just practicing this in a public space. Um, you know, obviously don't get so close that um, somebody thinks that you're doing something strange. Um, and if you can make some of these predictions, then your social intuition is getting better. If you constantly make incorrect predictions, then you're probably misunderstanding something. So take note of that and apply this lesson to the next people you observe. So it's a very practical, you know, something you can do on your own in your spare time, you know, when you're out in the park having a drink or a lunch or whatever. And over time, as with any skill that you practice, um, he has found you can get better at social intuition. Oh, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try that one myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, just last couple of questions then, Sharon. Well, 
Um, the middle way, as we understand it, is, is the idea that, you know, we make better judgments by avoiding fixed or dogmatic beliefs about things. Um, that then throws us back on experience, so we're left in this sort of messy, uncertain middle. But it's arguably in the messy, uncertain middle that we actually start to get to grips more adequately with the phenomena that we encounter, whatever they are. Now, now how might that relate to, to what we've been talking about today, do you think? Yes, I love the messy, uncertain middle. I love the rejection of extremes that the middle way teaches, um, you know, whether it's Aristotle's golden mean yeah. or or the, the Buddha's view of life um, and the actions and attitudes that will bring about well-being. And the reason I do is because extremes are dogmas like the brain does not change, like the genes you inherit from your parents will determine everything about you. Um, those sorts of things, even within science, we have learned are almost invariably incorrect. It's in the messy middle where life is lived and where the interaction of genetics and the brain and your experiences and the people you are with, that's where, that's how we become who we are. Um, so I think this is absolutely relevant to a middle way of looking at the world and at ourselves. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more there, um, Sharon. And um, what for you personally is is your greatest hope for the book? You know, I feel I'm on a teeny bit of a crusade to push back against the um, determinism that comes out of so many science studies and especially how science studies are portrayed in the in the general media. Um, you know, the press will show some striking image of a, you know, an fMRI scan or a, you know, a PET scan of brain activity and say, look, this is how somebody who's in love is, or this is how somebody who, I mean, whatever it is. And you see that brain scan and you think, oh, well, that's fixed. That's what I am. That's like, you know, an x-ray of my arm bone. I'm not going to change that. Um, and as we were saying earlier, that's not only a dispiriting message, it's a disempowering message, but it's a scientifically wrong message. So if I can get across even a little bit of that in my books, um, I will consider it time well spent. Sure, and I'm sure you've done that today as well, uh, Sharon. Okay, my, my last question, if people wanted to find out more about your work, how would they go about it? Well, um, thanks to my wonderful son, I do have a very rudimentary, primitive website. Um, okay. pe people can go to that and keep up with what um, I am doing. It's Sharon L, my middle initial L, Begley.com. Great. Okay. Well, it's uh, been absolutely fascinating talking to you today, Sharon, and giving you this, this really great overview of what emotional styles are and, and for what I think I personally which have an, an enormous practical value for, uh, you know, for everyone who, who could engage with them. You can find out more about Middle Way Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.